Democrat and nonprofit organization, um, the, the legal rights of uh, children, low income children. So I, I represent a lot of uh, children with disabilities. And let's pass it off to Adam. Thank you. Um, Adam Saucier, I'm a, a web developer at uh, Manchester Community College, um, a Wethersfield resident for about, a, for about a year now. I've been here with my wife. Um, I, I started uh, my web development career focusing on uh, web accessibility, making sure that people with disabilities, um, like, um, specifically, usually it's people who are blind or, um, or have motor disabilities and they can't use a mouse, for example, or they can't use um, a keyboard, things like that, uh, making sure websites are accessible to, to everyone, um, to as many people as possible. I think that's uh, it's one of the most important aspects of of the internet in general. Oh, what, uh, what brought me here? If we're not speaking, everybody, please. Like this. Like you got to pass it off, Adam. Yep. Yeah, sorry. That was. Um, how about uh, Paul next? Hi everyone, I am Paul Brady. Sorry you're not able to see me tonight, but I don't know what's going on with Zoom. Um, so I work at the LLB. Uh, I, uh, well, I was drawn to this uh, committee, uh, particularly, well, it's a bit personal because I do have a, a godson that is um, autistic and I also have a nephew that's also autistic. So. Um, it's a bit personal for me, um, where, as it relates to uh, the committee, and um, I also want to uh, see this committee be a little bit more visible in town. And I believe there's a lot that this committee this committee can offer to residents, not only uh, not only for children, but for also adults that are also. Um, uh, that also have disabilities. So that's my reason for joining the committee. Oh, I have to pass this off, right? Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy? Can we please um, mute who's ever on the cell phone? I'm Cindy Jacobs. Um, I worked for uh, many years in policy and energy policy, and I work for the Public Utility Commission. Uh, so I'm just familiar with policy. I'm retired now, so I kind of like the idea of just being on a town committee. Um, I also have a daughter, um, an adult daughter, um, a person with Down syndrome. So um, I'm I'm also used to being a part of this community too, and um, I have some ideas and that and uh, priorities, and I'd like to see uh, moving forward. Okay, let's go to our esteemed treasurer, John, John B. You're on mute, John. Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, my name is John Beretta. Uh, I'm retired. Um, I basically uh, been in town for 50 years. I've had a daughter, Kimberly Beretta, who's now 40 years old, has been through the therapeutic rec programs, the schooling in Wethersfield, and right now she resides in uh, Windsor in a group home. And uh, Natalie asked me a couple of years ago if I would be interested in rejoining this committee and help her out. And so here I am. So I don't know who to transfer to next. So I don't have a list of the names here. So okay, John. 
please. Thank you, John. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Catherine, did you call me for next? Yes, sorry, I'm being, oh, okay. here, but it's the Great. only way. No, no, thanks. I, I heard part of my name, but not the full name. So I just want to make sure. So uh, John Kazara, I'm the uh, director of uh, special services for the uh, school system. I've been there now for, I think it's going into my fifth year. Um, and, uh, you know, while I'm here, first of all, uh, our number one goal, and I've shared this before, it's to build high quality inclusive environments. Uh, but that's not only in school. We know school is only one piece of the community. And so, you know, any way that I can help out, um, you know, with that goal for the community and uh, and really been working with, uh, you know, students that have, uh, you know, disabilities probably for my whole career, either in alternative settings um, or in school settings. Oh, and I'll pass it now to... Um, is Natalie on? I am on. <laughs> Great. <laughs> nice to hear your voice. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I'm Natalie Morrison. I have lived in town for a little over eight years. I've worked for the town for a little bit over 23 years as the former therapeutic recreation supervisor. And just to give you a little bit of background on me personally, I grew up with a father who had multiple sclerosis in a time where there was not a lot of access, you know, uh, facility wise or program wise. And that drew me to my career. And I am just currently still involved because I believe in the cause. So let's see who would like it next. Um, how about um, Councilman Biggs? Good evening, everyone. Um, Councilman Biggs, obviously we do um, get appointed to certain um, committees and commissions once we take on the role of council, but we also have the option of selecting them. So. Um, I was afforded that option when we went around to uh, redo it. And um, I have a big passion for serving underserved communities. Um, I had a best friend that grew up with me and her, her son had autism. Um, and for a while she hid and didn't really want to tell anyone because she felt she would be um, judged a certain way. Um, and we really tried to encourage her to, to not really hide it. Um, and that kind of made me realize that this is this goes on on a, on a regular basis that a lot of people try to hide um, either, you know, the disabilities of their family and friends because they don't want to be judged. So I guess I'm just here to help people understand that you, you won't be judged. You're a human being and, and we're here to support you regardless. So thank you for having me here tonight. And also, I have a 7 uh, p.m. council meeting just to uh, let you know. So if I if I dip out, it, it's no disrespect. Good, good, thank you. Um, I think we have Derek. Hello everyone. <clears throat> My name is Derek Greger, I'm the town engineer. Um, it's, been, it's been a few years since I've been to this committee, uh, have been in the past. Um, I'm here tonight to uh, present to you, we'll give you some information regarding our sidewalk programs that I manage here in town. Um, just kind of give you an overview of what we've been doing the last couple of years since I've been to this committee and also uh, to solicit some feedback from you if you have uh, specific areas of concern with the upcoming season. Um, you know, it's something I'd like to do a little bit more regularly as we go forward. So um, that's all I have. Turn over to Chris. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm the uh, town elderly services coordinator and I guess it's over six, 36 years. <laughs> that I've been working for the town and, and um, helping um, people that are young 60 year olds and older and uh, people with disabilities. And um, I do have a, a master's in marriage and family therapy. And my dissertation was uh, working with a family uh, with a daughter with Asperger's uh, disease. So I'm very interested in helping people and dedicate it and here as a resource 
uh, person for you if you have any questions or here to help in any way that I can. Great, and I think Jaleem is last. I don't know. I don't know who's next, John, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it's me. <laughs> uh, Jaleem Catino, um, fairly new to Weathersfield. Um, took over Natalie's role, uh, previous role as therapeutic recreation supervisor. Um, I've been working in the field with therapeutic recreation for over 10 years now. Um, I wanna say working at Yale Hospital for my, um, for my internship is what really opened my eyes to working with people with special needs. And um, I would say ever since then is what really kept the ball rolling with me trying to stick to this population. And then once coming on to Weathersfield, um, hearing about this committee, it was kind of excited me a little bit because um, that was one of my goals to get into municipal recreation and bring more attention to the special needs population. So that's, that's what I have to say. <laughs> Okay. All right, thanks everybody. Um, as you guys know, Paul and I co-chair, so just trying to shake things up a little here. I know we have some agenda items tonight, so we will start with that. Um, and thank you for all the new folks who are joining us. I should say I'm sitting outside of Griffith Academy where I spend uh, six of my seven days. This is the dance school in Old Weathersfield, in case you don't know. Um, so joining you live from Griffith Academy. Um, and uh, after some of the agenda items, I know Paul and I have kind of discussed some things that we want to um, raise as ideas for kind of next steps and uh, kind of what we want to see differently or what we want to see happen through this committee and um, how to establish visibility visibility, and how to make sure that we are um, supporting all the different facets of, of the populations that we are tasked with serving. Um, so let's start with Paul, if you don't mind taking over for me while I figure out my technology. Sure, go ahead. All right, so um, I guess we will did we even, uh, I thought we were supposed to uh, call the meeting to order as per the governor's executive order. I don't remember if you did that or not, did you? No, please, please do all the official things. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to call uh, this meeting to order, um, Mar this March 1st, uh, 2021 meeting to order as per Governor uh, Lamont's uh, executive order. Um, so, uh, can we read, uh, Madam Secretary, could you read the first item on our agenda? The... I believe our secretary is not present. Is not, he's not present? No. Okay. Will anyone like to volunteer to be the secretary tonight? I elect Jaleem. <laughs> I'll take it, I guess. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, do you uh, mind reading the first uh, uh, agenda item on our, the first item on our agenda tonight, Jaleem? All right, um, we went through the introductions. Next, we have any public comments, and I don't believe we have anyone from the public here. Um, okay. So moving on to new business. Do we, so um, our new business, I think um, in this section, we could probably talk about um, a discussion that uh, Catherine and I had as far as um, where we would like this committee to go as um, and as far as the committee being visible and um, doing the best we can for uh, residents in town, not just a uh, younger population, but also adults with disabilities. So um, Catherine and I had a conversation and of course, um, one of the things that I know I would like to uh, to see happen in town as far as a committee is to 
somehow, um, you know, if there's a way for us to possibly raise more funds to help adults that are in need um, and uh, also get in this, the school board a bit more involved. I know uh, given COVID and all that, uh, there's been a lot happening, uh, especially with uh, kids with special needs. I know um, from talking to some teachers um, in different school districts and stuff, it's been a really tough learning curve. And of course, we want to make sure that those parents with uh, special need children and um, that aren't familiar with technology have the resources that they need and that they feel supported. So um, is there any discussion um, from any of the uh, committee members on this topic? Well, um, let me let me just say this here, and if you could, in the in the next, I guess our next meeting, as far as the agenda, just list the uh, treasurer's report down, so at least the board knows how our this board knows how much money we have to spend, and um, we can take it from there. Um, Matt, yes, I, I got, I, sorry to cut you off. Um, I actually did get that, and I apologize for not sending that out too. No, okay, well. Uh, just to let everybody know, we have $6,618.65 in our account. And that's a, as of March 1st. Um, the only thing that Natalie didn't do is she didn't send it, get a check for the uh, food bank for $150. And that, I think, was taken care of either today or I'll be taken care of tomorrow. So um, that's it. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, do we have an annual allocation of a budget or is this something that uh, we have to raise money to have we, a budget? We, we, uh, we used to, and then they, uh, they did away with it with the town budget. So basically we have to fundraise ourselves. Okay. And right now we haven't had any, I mean, I, I see one of the re uh, things they're gonna bring up today about fundraising and uh, hopefully uh, we can generate some money through some type of project so um i'm all ears and i'm all willing to help so uh if anybody has any ideas just let me know i know it's going to be uh i i would think the way we're spending money here we got we got at least three years of uh funds to help out because i think right now we have a grant program which i believe we uh let out uh i think it's two hundred dollars a person, I think we only a lot uh, one a quarter. So, um, to, you know, and basically that's for helping out with camps or uh, therapeutic rec fees or whatever it could be. So uh, definitely we do have to have some fundraising though to get this up a little bit. Um, I, I used to be a member of this group probably, oh God, when my daughter was in grammar school. And, and one of the things that irritated me and one of the reasons why I left this group is they had, they, at the time that I can recall, they had like $10,000 or $15,000 in the account. And the person that was in charge wouldn't spend the money on anybody. And I, I just, to me, it was a waste of, it, this is a waste of time. But uh, thank God Natalie got involved in this a couple of years ago. So now at least we have this grant program and this. I guess if you hear of anybody that night might need $100 or $200 or something like that, let us know or let Natalie know and we can discuss it over our meeting or during our meeting. So, so that's it. Thank you, John. Uh, Natalie, um, could you um, provide some guidance here as to um, uh, what type of programs we would possibly spend this on for uh, folks in town? Sure. So right now we have three annual events, a picnic, a Thanksgiving dinner, and a holiday party. And we allocate a certain amount yearly for those parties. And then Parks and Rec also um, provides funds. And I apply for an MDC grant every year to help with those three events as well. The grant program that John was discussing, basically um, every quarter, residents in town have the ability to fill out an application and we will allocate up to two per quarter. So that's $400. Um, 
And if they receive a grant, they're not eligible for another one for two years so that we can cycle through as many people and assist as many people in the community. And that could be in-town camps, out-of-town camps, special devices to help in their classrooms, um, assistance with repairing any type of accessible equipment that they might use at home or, or in their daily living. So it really is a range. In the past, we've helped someone with a uh, wheelchair repair. We've given money to a classroom for uh, accessible seating, just different types of seating. We, I believe we gave money towards the Mikey's Place Playground. That was a way back probably in, in early 2000. We have used the money to buy accessible, when I say accessible, it's not really accessible, but it chairs with arms. When we did a big order at the community center, we had a lot of chairs without arms, but being that we have um, large events there, we have senior events, we thought that we might need some with arms. So this committee uh, donated towards that as well. And then we also have used money to print and disperse a publication of accessible resources within the state of Connecticut. We haven't done that in a while. Um, I think the last time we did that was maybe in 2009. And I believe it's located somewhere on the web. I don't know off the top of my head. Anybody have questions? Just a uh, comment on that, Natalie. Just want to make sure that um, you know any items or devices that are necessary for children for students to access their education. Um, that is part of our budget. So, you know, just to make sure if you see any of it that way, um, you don't have to use the money that you have. That is, we are obligated uh, to provide it as the uh, special services department of the uh, schools. You know, I like that answer, John. Um, I have, I have another uh, item of new business if we're, if we're good with that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was thinking along those lines, um, you know, Paul and I talked a lot in our conversation about, as he mentioned, um, children with special needs and how they've been faring during this time. And of course, this is, this is statewide, this is nationwide, this is everywhere, um, that, that our children have suffered the most in many cases. Um, so I was hoping that maybe for the next meeting, if we put together some questions we have for you, John Carzer, of, of, you know, kind of next steps that um, the school district is doing to help either remediate or help support kids going to get back to where they, they maybe could have been, um, of course, through no fault of anyone's own, but kind of what the, what the supplementary steps might be for kids in our district. Um, it'd be great to know. And um, and to share as widely as possible and uh, make sure that, you know, we, we are seen as a hub and as a resource in town for, um, you know, for those students. Yep, and absolutely, I can do that. I, I will share that even right from the beginning, uh, we really took the uh, uh, third addendum from the uh, AAA document, which was um, students with high needs. And um, in Weathersfield, we really opened that up that we know our students um, you know, really with the most intense needs, and I'm talking about like a specialized programs, um, we opened that, those up from uh, to four days a week. Uh, and I'll say right from the very beginning of the school and then opened up our engagement teams to look at that. But please, any questions that people have, because right now an especially important time that we're really looking at the ESSER funds um, and how to use that. And especially we know all our children, I mean, you know, they are suffering as a result of the uh, pandemic. Um, academically, socially, emotionally, in every way. And so we are um, right now, um, wow, it seems like it came out yesterday, but I think it was two weeks ago um, that we got the uh, guidelines for the ESSER funds and starting to really look at how we prioritize those money for our students. So please, any questions then I'll, I'll come I have, back. Can I ask a follow-up question to that actually? Because I hear a lot of districts saying, um, and it's 
it's understandable that they don't want to use ESSER funds for additional staffing because they can't maintain the staffing. Is that, is that kind of the general feeling everywhere? I, you know, I could say my own feelings and I think I'm hearing it from most of uh, Weathersfield. Um, and I know, I think it was about eight years ago, there were some uh, grants that were going around really looking at some of the social emotional areas and um, town I was in just like Weathersfield, we uh, uh, got a variety of social workers. Um, the grant dried out and two years later, we were laying off a lot of social workers. And so, um, you know, especially right now, we're looking at really um, the learning loss that's happening and how we build that up, including with some of our some, you know, summer programs to really help students compensate for that, but also maybe using some agencies that can come in. And, you know, one thing I'm looking at the agencies with is how they can build our internal capacity to look at things a different way. Um, and maybe I'll even say this because I know I uh, sometimes we get stuck in school systems looking at the educational piece. And uh, um, I think it was Cindy that was saying she's a family therapist and how we open up to more wraparound services that so many of our children need, um, you know, including the family uh, um, component of it. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, sorry, my daughter's coming in. <laughs> I think that's, it does. I think that's a, shh. I think that's a reality for um, for a lot of districts. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, when we think about social emotional health and, and well-being, um, your first, your, you know, your mind first goes to the, the human beings there that can be supportive and who can kind of offer that, um, whether it's whether it's direct services or just helping kind of um, with, with the embedded social emotional learning. Um, so I, I understand, you know, both sides of that. Uh, but I do think there's a lot of um, capability for um, maybe contracting with um, agencies that can provide some kind of supplemental tutoring or, um, you know, maybe not have to hire on additional staffing and carry that cost, but at least um, provide, you know, some kind of service that way. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Now, um, actually, Natalie, I, I had a question I wanted to um, to ask uh, as it relates to, I know you said in the past we've used the funding to um, put together uh, information as far as ac accessible service for um, our uh, able um, resident. Um, and we haven't done that, you said, since 2009. Is that correct? I believe so. I'd have to actually look at the document because I think we did have a date, but I recall around 2009 was the last time we updated it. And um, I follow up question here. I, do you have any idea how, um, I guess, effective that information was? Did people find it useful? Um, um, I believe some did. We did have a couple of braille copies made as well. And at that time we had several um, persons who were visually impaired that made use of those and shared it amongst themselves. And I know Chris Taylor also distributed the booklet from her office for anybody that uh, expressed the need in trying to find services. Chris, do you have any input on that? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, yes, uh, people you know, did find it very helpful. There was a lot of good resources in the booklet, but I'm you know, since that time, it does need to be updated. <laughs> you know, since 2009, there's things that have changed and maybe agencies that are no longer, you know, available. Uh, yeah, well, definitely, absolutely. Um, I, actually, Natalie, um, with uh, the permission of uh, the other members of the board, I would like to I think revisit that where we possibly spend some money to up update that. Um, update that booklet um, and make that current to see if we could actually distribute that out to um, residents in the community. I think especially now given COVID-19, uh, it, it's it would be a, extremely valuable to um, to our residents. I agree. In the past, what we've done is given everybody a section to work on and uh, kind of call in and if the name has changed or if the resource have changed or if it closed up shop, make those changes and then it would go centralized to uh, a member, one member of the committee to 
um, make those changes within the actual uh, final document. Okay, so I, I think we should put this on um, for our next meeting um, if there needs to be further or deeper discussion and how we go about tackling this, but um, I would definitely like to see us get this done. Can I have the name of this booklet? I'm not familiar with it. I don't recall the name of the booklet. And again, I'd have to look on the web to see how to find it. But I believe if you go to the town website, there is a link to it. I just, off the top of my head, it, I don't recall it. I mean, if just we put it in words, what it does, I mean, it's, if we're gonna just call it, what would we call it? I'm just trying to write something down. Update. Um, Connecticut uh, resource booklet for persons with special needs or disabilities. Okay. Booklet. okay. Well, um, I would just say that um, it, it sounds great. We can all take a look at it. I mean, maybe I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but um, if we're thinking about um, publishing it and printing costs and all that, I mean, are we just as well um, to update it for the purposes of posting it on the website? Do people really need to have something in hand? I think some people will definitely need it in hand. A lot of people are not tech savvy or might not have the resources at home, um, especially, um, I don't know about the braille copies, but it was quite useful oh. in the past. It, I believe it came out to two or 250 total for the amount that we printed. We might have a record of it. If Jillian wants to try digging around our archives, we might have a record of it. Okay. All right. Well, that sounds reasonable. I mean, uh, rationale for p printing it. I think we would also have to make sure we translate it into um, at least some of the major languages. I know that you can do that, you know, through Google Translate right online through the whole website, but just for the printed copies, it'd be great to have some of those on hand as well. I, I found it on the website. I don't, I'm not finding a chat within the within Zoom to post the link, but it's um, it's just, yeah, it's a document from 2009, uh, September 13, 2009 called Services for People with Disabilities. It's like 73 pages. Is that the one we're talking about? Yes, I believe it is. Yeah, it would, it's, it's good too if, if it's a web, if it's a PDF on the web to make sure it's um, uh, tagged correctly and that it's, that it's accessible for people using screen readers. So that's something I could, uh, check out when, when we get to the final version of the of the updated PDF because it looks like this one was like a scanned uh, physical paper that, that, that then was like scanned to detect what the text was in it. So it'll need to be sort of, I, ideally it could all be written out uh, again, like in a Word document or something and then exported to a PDF. So it's not a scanned paper copy again. Okay. Yeah, could you con could somebody convert that? Are you saying, or you want to? You think we need to retype it? Um, I ideally retyped because when when it's a scanned physical copy, um, and then you try to convert it like to a Word document from there, it'll do a lot of weird things with like characters that it doesn't recognize. Um, so if it's typed out again in Word and then converted from there to a PDF, that would be. Uh, I, that'd be ideal for having it accessible on, on the web. Print it out, it doesn't matter quite as much, but. Um, I, would, I, would, I would post the link to it, but like I said, I don't, for some reason, there's not a, uh, there's not a chat in this, in this meeting. Okay. Um... So I think um, we should probably put make sure this is on for next meeting. Um, we'll have a more in-depth in discussion about it and uh, review um, what updates when we would like to make. And of course, uh, like my co-chair said, we uh, need to also ensure that it's also in uh, the other ma major languages that are uh, spoken in town. So. Um, is there any further um, uh, 
new business that we, the committee would like to discuss. If not, um, if the secretary could move on to the next item. Uh, oh, go ahead. I have some, <clears throat> I have some new business. Um, right, Cindy. Yeah. Um, one of the things that my family and I, uh, I do with my family, uh, my husband, my daughter and I, uh, we run. We run outdoors. And that has just been so beneficial on many levels. Uh, my daughter loves to run. She's very fit. And so it's kind of occurred to me, I know that the 5Ks are shut down and uh, they're supposedly gonna start up in March. And my daughter's never run a, a, a 5K. And I, I just got to thinking about, you know, having this as a unified sport. And I talked with the, uh, one of the people, uh, one of the administrators in, um, in Special Olympics, and his name is Mark. Uh, Natalie, you would know his name. Um, Mark Mercadante. Uh, and so he was mentioning that there are a number of running clubs, uh, unified running clubs across the state. Uh, my idea is that, uh, let's say in a 5K, anyone, um, this is kind of where I was starting out, anyone who was uh, a participant in a Special Olympics, a special athlete, it could, could participate. And just for, for doing that, they would get a participation uh, medal. And uh, he could make available those participation medals. And if that were the case, then you'd have not only the sign up for the regular um, run, but also they would have an, an additional special, special Olympic sign up if they're gonna be a part of that. Um, and also you'd probably have uh, a runner with that person, especially for young people. Um, so you'd have um, it, a, a typical runner uh, running with them. And so it, I, I wanna bring that up. I think it's, uh, a, a running is a great sport. I, for me, I'm not uh, that coordinated and it's just <laughs> a good way to get exercise and get outdoors. And uh, I, I um, you know, I, I like, um, 5K races. I'd like to see my daughter in one, and you know, kind of a way that um, people who are Special Olympic athletes can join um, typical athletic events. And uh, so I, I just kind of open that up. Uh, it doesn't sound like it would be. A, I mean, we could. I, it, the, Mark seemed to be uh, in the direction of establishing a running club, which I think would be great. I mean, running can you can do that all year, or you could do it three seasons of the year. Uh, so um, I just kind of open that up and just get people's reaction. I guess it would be in kind of the TR world, and I don't know what your but if that calls for a budget or what that all entails. So I'm just kind of bringing up the facts, as you know, get the reaction of the uh, response of the committee. Thank you. I think that's a idea and we should send it over to our esteemed therapeutic recreation folks to comment on first. Sure. Um, so in the past the, uh, we've had we run year-round programs for Special Olympics. One of the programs that we coordinate is the Unified Sports Club and it's where we take part in different types of fitness activities and do walking and running and it's held once a week quarterly during the different um, seasonal programs. In the past, I have offered for those athletes interested to take part in different 5Ks in town. And I have partnered with them to meet them at the Mikey's Place or the Keene Race and have them complete the, the race with me. And they just get whatever participation medal that they hand out to everyone else. Um, also, as being a part of the Unified Fitness Club, they offer two big events throughout the year where you can join in a different activity, whether you're going hiking in the woods or you're going to Suffield Academy to participate, again, in either a short run or different fitness activities. And then they also pay for you to participate in the Hartford race that they held um, in October. They will pay your athletes and partners to participate in that race up to a certain amount of athletes if you have someone interested. And that information goes out monthly, I believe, in a newsletter to anyone registered with the Special Olympics program. So any coach.
coaches, any parents that have provided their information to Special Olympics gets the newsletter. And I believe it would be also available on their Special Olympics site as well. Um, but I think it's great. It might be something that's potentially doable through the high school, you know, the track team, those, you know, who already are fit and can maintain that or just opening it to the regular student body. Um, I would encourage to start with one age group before you open it to all levels so that you have enough partners for anyone that might be interested. Oh, okay. So it sounds like there are things afoot, no pun intended, but it, there, there are some resources that are sort of had allocated in this direction. Maybe we need to talk offline so I understand what's there to begin with, and maybe it just kind of fits naturally in that. So I'd be happy to talk with uh, Natalie and Jaleen if, uh, if that's, if we could do that. Sure, that's not a problem. Definitely. I also just I could... wanted to... I'm sorry, I just want to add one more thing. They also have a statewide unified fitness team through Special Olympics where anybody from any town can join and you meet with your partner and run with uh, your partner during those practices. And then they have a, a special competition that they do annually. I'm not sure if it's at state summer games or not, but that's also another avenue as well. Okay, well, we can, yeah, that would be, I'd be happy to discuss it. I don't know if, yeah, okay, that's fine. I know that the events that Juliana has participated in have been more short distance, like there's the 100 meter dash and there's the uh, 50 meter and there's a four by 100, but as far as like a 5K or a heart, you know, a longer kind of cross country type thing, I wasn't aware of anything. So be happy to talk about it. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, I definitely support that. And um if anyone wants a very unbelievable inspirational story, um, Team Hoyt, uh, and the Hoyts were the winner of the uh, uh, Bobby V uh, uh, ESPN Award a couple of years ago. Um, they're right over the border in Massachusetts. So, I mean, right over the border. Um, and just an unbelievable inspirational story about uh, a father-son combination who've, uh, I, I think they participated in, I'm going to say like over 50, and it might even be 100 marathons and triathlons and everything else and what an inspirational story we, we even have one of our Weathersville high school students that is on the, uh, the traditional track team thank you for sharing that too Cindy though that's exactly what we're looking for is to you know people to bring their experiences and to bring their everyone's talking about the different you know ways they can contribute so um, I think maybe for the next meeting, if you guys can share, um, you know, the, what you guys talk about and see if there's any holes or any gaps that we can do to, um, to support the efforts. Absolutely. Actually, um, do we still have our councilman on the, um, on, on the meeting? I, um, I also, uh, I know earlier was mentioned that, uh, town council actually used to, uh, provide, uh, a, a the committee with some form of a budget, I would like to know if that's something that the, our councilman, since he's a liaison for this committee, could, um, you know, petition the board to find out if that uh, line item for us to be uh, reintroduced into the budget, um, especially given these times. Um, I'm pretty sure there are uh, many things that we could find to uh, spend the money on for residents um, in our community. Yeah, by all means, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's why I'm here uh, to be a liaison for you all. And if there is a concern of uh, budget assistance where the council has to bring it up and propose that it's, get, it, it's supported, um, yeah, I have no problem doing that. You tell me what you need from me and that's exactly what I'm gonna do. you for that um my co-chair do you I, uh before i'm sorry um also we're actually about to kick off um so i'm going to log off of this one and uh, head over to the town council meeting um so just thank you all for tonight um a lot of information like i said I, i'm here to support thank you thank you for joining us 
Catherine, was there anything that you uh, like to add uh, aside from what was previously said? Um, no, thanks. I'm good. I'm, I'm just happy that we're generating ideas. And again, I know John B, this is making you happy that things a lot are different. happening. <laughs> it's a lot different, I'll tell you. Things are happening and you know, again, we. We have such skill and experience that we want to harness. That's the whole point. So I think it's, it's exciting. That's good. All right. Um, do we have anything else that we would like to discuss in, uh, in the new business section? If not, we will um, ask our acting secretary to move on to the next item on the agenda. All right. Next we have... Uh... Derek G up to discuss the annual sidewalk programs. Right. Hey, well, thanks for having me tonight. Um, like I said, I have been at this uh, committee before, but it's, it's probably been two or three years at this point. Um, generally, I stayed in touch with Natalie from time to time if there were things that came up. Um, so I'll do that with you now, Jaleem. Um, just, I just want to give you an overview of some of the programs that we do that are related primarily sidewalk, sidewalk ramps, um, ADA compliance and things of that nature. So you just know what's going on and give you an update on some of the projects we have coming up. Um, so if you don't know, the town does have an annual sidewalk program that's for repairs and maintenance of sidewalks, sidewalk ramps. Um, currently we have a contractor who's TNT landscapes, uh, TNT concrete and landscapes out of Hartford. They're in the second year of a two year contract. Um, if you've been around town, you know we have a lot of sidewalks that are in poor condition. Um, here by ordinance, the, pro the budding property owner owners are responsible for maintenance and repairs, which can make things a little bit tricky. I do have a part-time sidewalk uh, inspector who works for me, who does do inspections and does issue notices to uh, budding property owners to, and works with them to get the improvements done. But he's only part-time and with just other re you know, requirements of him, he doesn't have a lot of time for that. Um, that being said, I did have some recent retirements from my department, so I'm looking to restructure. And with that, I'll have, I'm looking to hire another construction inspector and have another civil engineer available um, that I'm hoping will give us the opportunity to spend more time uh, doing sidewalk inspections and trying just to you know, make, improve the conditions of the walks faster here in town. We do uh, typically get annual budget for sidewalk repairs. They're funded through our, my operating budget and the engineering department. Um, that's for sidewalk repairs that are along town properties or in front of private properties where town trees may have caused issues or a town crew or town contractor um, did something that was uh, that we're responsible for, then we do that work. Um, we also have a CIP or capital improvement program here in town. And generally every year I go to the committee that handles that. I ask for money for repair to sidewalk ramps. Um, one of the big pushes in the last few years is to whenever we're paving a road, we do a paving program every year. Anytime we're replacing pavement, whether it's a milling and overlay or a full reconstruction, we've been going out and replacing sidewalk ramps when needed. So if they're not the right slope, if they're cracked or broken, if they don't have the um, ADA tactile warning tiles uh, there, we will you know, have to make sure they get put in. And that's an ADA requirement now. Any, any municipality that touches a road is supposed to do the abutting a sidewalk ramp. So I've been fortunate that I've been able to get funding for that in recent years. We also have some money available through those two funding sources if we just come up with areas where we feel it's needed. Um, this past fall, we just uh, put a new uh, sidewalk extension and a crosswalk over on the north end of Main Street as you enter Cove parking lot because there had been some complaints and concerns about the speed of vehicles and people not having a really safe place to cross. Um, so we do have some flexibility in the funds. We estimate what we think we're gonna need, um, but certainly I'm open to input from, uh, from the committee at any time um, for any improvements you might need and we can look into what we can do. There has been a big push lately here in town to really look at bicycle and pedestrian safety and also mobility throughout town. Some of the ongoing uh, safety improvement projects that we have is uh, there is a bike ped work group that's been meeting that I'm a part of. Um, we've probably been meeting for the last couple of years. They're hoping to complete this plan uh, sometime during this year. And as part of that plan, we're looking at where it would make sense to have bike trails, um, to have accessible paths, uh, looking at sidewalk gaps where there's missing sidewalk sections that need to be filled in. 
and a, var a variety of other safety uh, improvements. As part of that, um, we did get a complete streets policy approved by town council last year, which is a subset of that plan, which encourages the town and any private developers to look at um, what, a complete street. So you're looking at bicyclists, sidewalks, ADA compliance, signage. They have to look at all those things as part of a project. It really applies probably more to the town and myself when we're doing projects, we try to consider and work in as much of that as we can. It also has an ADA transition plan, uh, which is a plan the town is supposed to already have. It's something that hadn't been done previously that has an outline on how we're going to make uh, all our town facilities uh, ADA compliant. And there's two segments to that. There's one that's related to buildings and there's one related to public right of way. So for public right of way, um, when this gets finalized, I'm gonna be assigned the ADA coordinator for that. And that plan is still under development, but that is something we're working on as part of the larger plan. And I think that will be uh, you know, beneficial in helping us at least have a plan for going forward um, which is a requirement by U.S. Department of Justice that we have a plan going forward and we have some plan to implement it as soon as the funding is available or we know what funding we can seek. Um, we do try and seek state funds when we can. We do have some projects coming up. Um, one of the state projects we have coming up, we got $3.2 million for reconstruction of Wolcott Hill Road. So the area from Jordan Lane north to the Hartford City Line is going to be completely reconstructed. Um, if you've ever been in that area, there's some sidewalk crossings there that are kind of exposed. You're out in the middle of the intersection. We're going to put some protected crossings in. Uh, new ramps are going in with all the uh, requirements part of the project. We're going to do some bus pull-off areas, try to get the buses off the, off the side of the road. So there's a lot of uh, bicycle and pedestrian uh, improvements. There's going to be bike lanes put in. So that we're in design right now. We're hoping to start construction on that this year. Um, we also got similar state funding uh, along Great Meadow Road to put in sidewalks. You may have heard that DOT is going to be doing a trail project for the Putnam Trail Bridge to connect down to Great Meadow Road. Right now, that's kind of isolated. We don't have any bike cycle facilities or pedestrian facilities to connect to the parking lot they're going to be building there. So this is a two-phase project, but we do have $720,000 for phase one, which is for sidewalk installation and some uh, limited uh, pavement marking improvements so we can have um, those facilities for, for pedestrians and bicyclists. That is probably a project um, that might be coming uh, next year or the year after. Uh, we did get a uh, grant from the state in Old Weathersfield for improvements at 11 different locations. They include uh, intersection realignments uh, to make pedestrian crossings shorter, um, new sidewalks, new ramps. That is uh, currently in design. We're hoping to start construction later this year uh, on those locations. Um, as well as right now, we're working with a group of UConn students as part of their senior design project are going to 14 different locations in town that between engineering, planning, and police department, we determine we're the, the most critical and are looking at all kinds of safety improvements uh, related to ADA compliance, but also signage, pavement markings, um, you know, condition of ramps, and going to give us some feedback on that to help us with our planning process so we know what kind of projects are out there. If we have funding available in the funds that we get annually, we can do some of that work. Other projects might be larger where we have to go out and get either state funding or capital funds for them, but we'll at least have a better idea of what we're gonna need. And um, we were just were contacted recently by the state. They're, they're doing a lot more now too with uh, pedestrian crossings and bicycles. Uh, they have a program that they're expecting to put out for uh, installation of rectangular rapid flashing beacons, which we don't have any in town right now, but that's where if you have a mid-block crosswalk, that's one that's not at an intersection, um, you can push a pedestrian button and it flashes. There's a, probably a three foot by six inch um, uh, rectangular fixture on top of a pedestal and that flashes to alert drivers that someone's in, entering the crosswalk. So we, we can put it into up to five locations. We did submit some preliminary ones and hopefully we'll get some funding um, from the state on that. And that would be uh, another added improvement. Um, so basically, I guess I'm just, I'm just here tonight to introduce myself. I know a lot of you are new since the last time I had been here, and i just here to see if you had any concerns, any specific areas. I know when I've been here in the past, some members had specific locations that they had a concern with, and we can look into that and see if we can get it addressed. So you can you know, feel free to let me know tonight. If you think of something down the road, you can reach out to me directly or uh, you know, notify Joe Lehman. He can let me know, and uh, we'll do what we can. Eric, I have, I have uh, two places for you. Um, okay. 
And I basically, I'm, I'm not, not for myself, but I know one area, uh, you couldn't even get a wheelchair over that bump. Uh, uh, the corner of Crest and, and Cedar with the sidewalk ends, about the third block in, you probably got about an inch, at least an inch rise in one of those, the sidewalk. And then you have, and I don't know why the town didn't make them do it when they put those apartments in on Ridge, but um, the apartments next to the bridge, the new bridge they put in, that sidewalk is actually starting a pot, uh, pothole. Okay. And I'm sure they're gonna have trouble with wheelchairs on that pretty soon. And we do have a few people walking that are blind on these sidewalks around. I live on Tollgate, so I can tell you around this area, I do see it, so I, those those are two areas that I know are really bad. So that's it. If I see any more, I'll let you know. Feel free, thank you. We'll, we'll check these out. I'd be happy to talk with you online about a particular intersection too, but I can talk to you out long, offline. Okay, sure. Can I, um, just quickly, I have, to, I have to run myself, but I uh, wanted to thank you obviously for coming and um, learning a little bit of the lingo. I do have two uh, things I'd like to follow up on maybe for another meeting, or at least we can get the information from you and then share it at the next meeting um, is one, what is the centralized way for people to you know, share their concerns? And um, is there any data on how those concerns are, you know, how many are, are addressed or how many are able to be addressed? I understand that you have some, you know, limitations in your capacity. So if we, if we hear, um, you know, 40 calls are called in a year and 20 are resolved or um, at least followed up on, that's my mm -hmm. first question. And I guess uh, along the same lines, my second question is how much can we um, ensure that uh, the folks who are having input in this, um, sorry, the folks who are having, um, you know, in input into the matter are those who are most affected by um, you know, the, the mobility issues. So I know uh, right now we don't have necessarily representation from that we used to have prior in this committee. And so making sure that we solicit input and feedback from the folks that are most impacted from um, any issues with mobility in the town. Okay. Before you leave, I, I just one thing I'd, I'd like to see if we can get, can we get a list of the members on the committee, their phone numbers and email just just in case something comes up in the meantime where we have to talk to somebody or yes instead of for a meeting i would, would appreciate it if you can send out an email with that if everybody's okay with it um yes thanks um, should, we, I'll take one more note. should we all send our um contact information to jaleen would that be the best thing yeah i think he probably has most of it but i guess we could always give um you know the do you have everything you need um i have the emails um as far as the phone numbers that's probably what i do need all right i'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow and give you my number all right. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else wants to do it fine but i i just would like to at least you can talk to somebody in the meantime so uh, because apparently you have to make appointments not even to go to the town hall. They won't even come to my house to clear a permit for me right now. So, so I, I can understand that. That's why I just like to get that list if we could. That's it. Well, to answer, I know Catherine had to step out, but to answer her question, it's part of the complete streets plan. Um, one of the requirements will be annually, we, we are going to track what we do for improvements. Um, you know, how many, like she indicated, how many complaints we get, how many we're able to fix, uh, how many sidewalk ramps get replaced, miles of sidewalk, or if we be the sidewalk that gets replaced. So that'll be something that will be start being tracked um, probably this year, actually 2021 now that we're in our first full year of it. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll provide my contact information. You can reach out to me anytime. And, um, you know, like I said, we, we do have limited funds, but we try to spend, you know, spend them as best we can, as efficiently as we can um, to help, uh, as was stated, really to help the people who are most in need. So if you hear anything, um, please don't hesitate to contact me. 
Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so can the secretary, okay, moving on, if the secretary will read the next item on the, uh, on our agenda. All Have right. Day, um, take care. Um, we have grants up next. So we haven't had any new grants since the fall. I believe Chris had someone who was possibly interested, but that information hasn't gotten back to us yet. Uh, Natalie, if I may um, uh, ask a question. On, um, on average, do, um, do we normally get a lot of those? Um, what are the numbers normally look like? No, we don't. We usually get one or two. And I would assume just based on previous that we'd get maybe a couple coming closer to April just because camps are going to be starting. And if um, parents are looking to register their children but might not have the funds for the camp, that's when they would contact us to see if they could have some assistance. Uh, when they do contact us, we also urge them to check the social and youth services for the campership and see if they qualify for that as well. Um, do you think that that's possibly, I don't know, how, how is this advertised as far as um, letting in residents know that this, uh, this type of resource is available to them? I, again, I, I don't know. Um, or do you think, and on top of that, do you think that residents are taking advantage of this um, or you think that some people probably don't know about that it, that the resource exists? I'm sure there are some individuals that are unaware in the past we have advertised in the rare reminder and then um, Chris Taylor in social media services she will share the information if there's someone who has a need and in the past I'm, I have also shared the information through our park and rec department as well. Um, and, within, and within the park and rec department, we also have an adult social club for persons with special needs, 22 and up, so that that group is also aware of it. But again, if they're not, if they don't have a need, they might bypass that, that thought because they haven't heard about it in a while because it wasn't something that they needed. So it's not something that everybody sees on a regular basis. Understood. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that we at least, um, you know, publish this uh, as much as possible so uh, that residents that are in need can take advantage of it some way. Um, if, at a, if it's not in the library, if there's some way that we could possibly uh, see if um, folks in the library would be willing to put that on their page or something to let residents know, I think that would also be a good idea. Um, any other members have any further discussion on or questions as it relates to grants? I just have one more comment. Uh, we just recently did the completed the spring brochure for our department, and we did advertise some social and youth services um, programs regarding um, assistance programs. So I can see if that's something that we can add to our summer brochure so that we can, again, begin advertising it a little bit more uh, broadly. Thank you for that. Um, if there is no uh, further discussion on this topic, um, can the secretary read the next? I think that it was that the last item on our agenda? Uh, we still have a spring, early summer events to uh, yeah. discuss, and also the group homes to discuss about the, um, the liaisons. Which liaisons. Yeah. If you, uh, missing some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess if you could read the next, the next item on the, uh, the agenda, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. All right. Uh, spring and early summer events. Okay, um, I guess Natalie, I'll lean on you for some guidance on this. Um, 
I know with COVID and all, um, uh, I don't know what to say about how spring, how does the spring event planning looks? Um, I think we're probably more, I guess, a bit more optimistic about summer than, than the spring events. Right. So, um, and because we didn't hold our Thanksgiving and holiday party, it was thought that we might want to do something in the spring um, committee wise. And, you know, that's why it's on our agenda this evening. However, um, I think to get the number of people that we would hope to get, I think we need to hold off a little longer. I know outdoor events is moving um, up in numbers, but the indoor events, you know, we can potentially get to a hundred come March, but do we want to have something that's still very socially distant where people are, are still distant? And um, right now, uh, community center wise, we are limiting how and what the interaction is when they book an event. So I would say let's table this for the next meeting when we have a little bit more information and potentially um, more to choose from. Uh, absolutely. So I guess um, with that being said, I'll make a motion to table that uh, um, item until our next meeting. I'll second it. Yep. All those in favor? Yep, good. Hi. Okay, um, so we'll table that for our next meeting. Um, and if the secretary could uh, uh, read our next, well. Right. Next or, we have uh, group homes and liaisons. Once again, Natalie, I'll be leaning on you here just to see how, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've, Comes with being new, right? Um, yes, yeah. So nope, um, it's I, not a I'll lean on you a bit here for some more guidance on this as far as how the, the liaisons have, all, have gone in the past. Um, so if you could just give some directions here. Sure. So um, the committee looks to reach out to the different group homes in town to make sure that there's open communication and um, information being exchanged if there's a need within that group home you know, as to their access to the community. Um, in the past, we've each taken a group home and are responsible for checking in with that group home on a monthly basis to make sure things are running smoothly as well as sharing our contact information should something come up and they'd like to reach us to assist with an issue or concern that they have, whether it's town related or neighbors or accessibility, anything of that nature. Um, in the past, we have invited the group homes to come to a like a separate meeting to kind of discuss any issues, and we haven't had uh, much interest when that came, uh, just because they didn't feel like they had a lot of concerns or issues. But I think at this point, especially during COVID, it might be more a a reach to ask if there's any needs that they have, any issues that they're, they might be experiencing because of COVID, any difficulty in getting supplies or in you know, providing any type of assistance um, to their you know, group homes and you know, making the contact with the direct care staff and the director of each of the group homes. So if every, Jaleem had attached to the email a group home, so if you have a particular group home that you'd be interested in connecting with, you can share that with Jaleem. Otherwise, we can just uh, assign a group home per individual so that we can share in uh, reaching out to them. How many group homes are there now? I don't have a list in front of me, but I want to say we have something like 10 or 11 and there might be more at this time. Uh, a lot of them are, let's see, we have Gooseberry, Ridgecrest. We actually use um, 117 Wells Road as a quote unquote group home, but it's, it's not, it's just Congo Good Housing. 
We have Maple Street, which is Lasher Court. We have Executive Square. I believe there is one by Crest Street. I'm not uh, We have Hartford Avenue, Megat Park, um, one on Highland. So there's enough for everybody to have one. I took two just because I know um, more of the individuals, but I would have to check also with like the police and the fire because sometimes they get information on group home living or um, sites because of like emergency needs so that they're aware. They just don't always report it to them. It's just an extra safeguard for them, but they might not have added themselves to the list because it is uh, voluntary. Well, uh, just a suggestion then. Why don't you just uh, assign each of, each one of us a, a group home and give us the contact information? We can make a call and tell them what we're calling them for and take it from there. All right. So, Jaleem, if you want to just give everybody a group home and then send out that attached flyer with their name under each of the group homes, they'll have the direct contact information um i um if, could i request um 117 wells because that's right in my neighborhood i don't see why not isn't there one on east street too oh eastern eastern oh, drive that's 117 was. eastern drive i'm sorry well i didn't write yeah 117 eastern drive Oh, it's 117 Wells Road. I think Eastern is 50. But I'll have Jolene just Wait a send minute. it out. There's one on Eastern though, right? Right. I think it's 50 Eastern Drive. Oh, okay. Well, that's the one I'm thinking of. I'm sorry. I'm all twisted around. So the no, one no, on no. E Eastern Drive. Yeah, it's, it's a, a ranch home. I know that home. Okay. Uh, when the liaison, liaison is reached out to, uh, if there's if the group home has a question, who who do we sort of go to with that request it sort of just depends on what what kind of request it is and then we it go it probably to. depends on the request i would assume it, it should go default to the chair or if there's someone that you know has a you know that resource that they're looking for on the committee you know um i would go to that individual but mm -hmm. also share it with the chair just so that they are aware of the the concerns or issues going on and then if it needs to get elevated um, usually the liaisons might get involved or we can discuss it at a meeting and then the liaison could take it further um, more on a case-by-case -case basis okay thank you if i would if possible i would request the the one on meadow gay since it's right uh, right down the street from me Jaleem, are you getting all this? Is, is Meadowgate a group? Is it like a? It is a group home. There group is, home? Um, they service um, some more elderly adults with um, special needs. Yeah. I walk by that house every day on a, on a, a walk I go on, so. Oh, perfect. I think we're done for tonight. Jaleem, I think I'll um, I'll request the one on um, Maple Maple Street. That'll be uh, three 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 Maple. And I think if that is, um, I think that was our last uh, agenda item, right? Yes. Okay, so. I would like to make a motion to call this meeting to adjournment. Um, Second. All those in favor? Yep. Aye. Okay. Good night, everyone. All right. Good night. Take care. Good night. Thank you all. Good night, Thank Good night you. guys. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.